So this is Virtual SQL Server Performance Deep Dive. My name is David Klee. I'm the founder of Heraflux Technologies. <clears throat> so normal housekeeping stuff. I understand we're all probably on call here. If the phone goes off, no big deal. Just set it to silent and everything will be good. Um, chances are, if you're here, you're already a member of PASS. Uh, please, it's not just the PASS Summit every year. There's SQL Saturdays, there's local groups, there's virtual chapters. You know, if it tells you anything, I run the HADR virtual chapter. We're looking for speakers, by the way. <clears throat> so my name is David Klee, like I said. I'm lucky enough to be a Microsoft Data Platform MVP and a VMware V expert. It's a lot of fun. We get to have direct feedback directly with Microsoft and VMware and a lot of the other companies out there to really you know, get them the challenges that we're all seeing and help, you know, really hope to get them to do something about it. Um, my contact information is up here. I'll have cards down here afterwards, you know, email address and that kind of stuff. Uh, again, if you, if you have any questions with the stuff, no marketing at all, email me. It may take me a few days to get back to you, but I will get back to you. Session evals, I can say this honestly for every speaker here, we all want to be better speakers. Please give constructive, candid criticism. Do not sugarcoat it, but at least give reasons. If you want to tell me that I suck, that's fine. Tell me why, and that's something I can do about it. <laughs> okay, what we're gonna talk through today, we're gonna have a lot of fun. What is virtualization to begin with? <clears throat> And then we're basically going to take the infrastructure stack and we're going to go bottom to top. We're going to talk about storage. We're going to talk about physical compute with CPUs and memory. We're going to talk about the hypervisor itself and some of the details there related to some of the common problems that we see. We're going to talk about the VM construction and stuff that you can do to balance your SQL server with the physical environment and make sure everything lines up. And then we're going to talk performance tuning and just a smidge of HADR in there if we get a little bit of time. <clears throat> Okay, we're gonna start with the four main food groups here. <clears throat> so first of all, CPU, memory, disk, and hopefully by now you're all in flash, and the network. Now, you know, when normally I tell people in this crowd what are the four main food groups, it's usually caffeine, caffeine, pizza, and sugar, right? <laughs> with caffeine in there twice, because that's really important. Uh, at the end of the day, though, all we're dealing with are these four things. Everything else is buzzwords, acronyms, availability features, things like that. At the end of the day, this is what matters. <clears throat> so now, what the heck is virtualization? Now, I know I've asked this a lot in here, but my take on this is that virtualization is nothing more than a tiny little operating system, and that allows multiple operating systems and whatever else runs inside there to coexist and run on the same piece of physical compute equipment. What it functionally does is it translates all those CPU, memory, disk, network resources into resource scheduling queues so that your virtual machines and whatever they need to do get access to them. It allows us to share and coexist these things. <clears throat> I mean, traditional bare metal, you'd have a SAN, might have flash, might have some SSD, regular you know, spindle storage in there. You've got physical compute. You've got some sort of interconnects and networking, maybe fiber to let everything communicate. Every one of these machines has got memory, CPUs, interconnects, things like that. You install Windows or Linux on there. <clears throat> Anybody playing with SQL Server on Linux? Got a couple of diehards up here, that's awesome. <clears throat> and then you install the operating system, and then you install the database engine connect the storage for you know, TempDB, data logs, things like that, and then turn it on and away you go. And at the end of the day, you might be 10% busy, 20% busy, because you've sized the equipment to be what you need at the end of the life of that physical equipment. So you just bought a Ferrari, and all it's doing is just sitting in the driveway idling. And every once in a while it spikes up when somebody runs a report or everybody logs on first thing in the morning. But for the most part, it's just nice and quiet. Well, by allowing the hypervisor in there, it's the same physical equipment. It's the same storage, for better or for worse. But now we've got a hypervisor. And functionally, it is just a little tiny operating system. But now I can have more than one of these compartmentalized bubbles on there, it's just VM. Each one of these VMs is assigned compute resources. So a certain amount of CPU, certain amount of storage, certain amount of memory but then I can have more than one. And maybe I can have a lot more than one, depending on the type of equipment that I've got. 
<clears throat> what this allows me to do is to take that physical machine and drive it harder. So I make more use of it. And that sounds crazy. At the end of the day, you got to be careful with this. Now, how many of you, just show of hands, have been burned by virtualization in the past? And I'll raise my hand in there as well. I've been virtualizing uh, production-grade equipment since 2003. At the end of the day, that was a long time ago. Things were nowhere near as good as they are now. And there's a lot of things that you learn over the years of doing this where you may get burned by it, but don't let it scar you. If you're careful, we can run this up. We can pile VMs on here carefully and make sure that everything runs just like we want it. <clears throat> At the end of the day, every one of those major food groups, CPU, memory, network, disk, these are shared resources. Being a DBA, I want my RAM. I want my CPU. It's mine. You know, I call myself a server hugger. <laughs> but at the end of the day, these are shared platforms. So it's OK if you're careful with it. But occasionally, you might have things called noisy neighbors. Things may go you know, haywire on the side. You know, this, this particular machine right here had a bunch of SQL servers on it. And you can see in orange down here, that's our first SQL server. You can see it's just CPU consumption visually. <clears throat> The second one in pink, DBO2, production active environment. And then you've got a bunch of other stuff there that's just sort of off to the side. But in this case, that was perfectly fine to let this coexist. And I'll give you a lot of the metrics as we go so you can actually see very clearly, very objectively, what's the performance penalty by having more than one VM on the same physical machine. And that objectivity is something I absolutely want to stress. How many of you have had shouting matches with your infrastructure team over this stuff? Yeah, most people in here. And it's real. It's hard. We have different frames of reference, different points of view with all of this stuff. So I'm going to show you a lot of these key metrics on how to actually do this stuff. <clears throat> so talking about shared metrics, this, click play, play, and come on. And play. So what this is, this is a hammered DB database benchmark. And what this particular environment is doing, <clears throat> these are three VMs on the same physical machine. <clears throat> same amount of CPU, just four CPUs, 32 gigs of RAM. The top left has been tuned. The very bottom, completely stock, SQL Server install, completely stock VM installation, nothing fancy. The one on the top right has had a little bit of tuning done, which is what your VM admins normally do. But at the end of the day, if you haven't noticed, these are not created equal. <clears throat> this is what happens when a lot of VM admins get things a little bit wrong. And by wrong, I mean default. Now, you as DBAs, every time you install SQL Server, you just you don't go next, next, finish, go, right? Tons of customization goes into it afterwards to make it what we need so we get the best possible performance out of it. This is a visual representation of exactly the same exact thing with a hypervisor. And this, that difference there, I mean, look at that. It's two and a half times performance difference. Exact same machine. By the way, all these are SQL Server 2019 RTM. So it's not like I just snuck in a SQL Server 2000 machine in here for the fun of it. <laughs> so let that run. <clears throat> OK. So now, when I say virtualization is resource queues, I do mean lots of queues. <clears throat> every single thing in the hypervisor for every VM and every compute resource has queues. CPU scheduling is arguably the, cha the biggest challenge for what we've got. So if I've got one VM, no big deal. The, queues, the time spent in the queue is going to be extremely short, so it just flows right through. But what if I do what most VM admins do and pile 50 VMs on the same physical machine? Well, these queues can stack up. The longer an entity, some task or whatever, is stuck in that queue, the longer things are going to drag on. The queue gets bigger. The queue gets deeper. Things slow down. Now, what does this do for your SQL servers? Get slower and slower and slower. And at the end of the day, Monday morning comes along, and you've got somebody standing at your desk with a baseball bat saying, why is this slow? 
And I say this because I used to have a boss with a baseball bat, and he would do that, and it was not fun. <clears throat> now, what we're going to do is we're going to talk through each component in the infrastructure stack and really work from the bottom up. So storage, enterprise storage is always at the bottom. Physical server, virtualization, you've got networking, maybe some fiber optics in there to let everything communicate properly. You've got the operating system. Now, some of you may be playing with application containers, so SQL Server in a container, which is really cool. You've got your SQL Server instance, and then one or more databases on there, and then your application that communicates uh, directly in, and then us geeks off to the side managing everything. <clears throat> Performance concerns are big with these things. They always have been, they always will be. My goal to make sure that we maximize performance is to minimize the time spent in the queue. So the shorter in there, the better. If we can get those queue times really low, we can get as close to bare metal performance as possible. And I can tell you very objectively, all the major hypervisors today are less than 3% performance overhead. And for the good hypervisors, and I want to keep my mouth shut on that one, you're looking at less than 1%. And to me, even a 3% performance penalty just to have all the benefits of being in a VM, that's worth it. The longer the time that's spent in the queue, the longer performance drags, the more variability in the environment you have, the more performance pain that you've got, and that's not fun. I've seen environments that after we fixed it, queries were running in one or two seconds. Before the fix, they were taking five to 10 minutes. And some of these things are as simple as right click, remove or drag and drop. It's that frightening. <clears throat> so our goal, we really need to minimize the queue overhead. So we're going to go bottom and top in here. Now we're going to start with enterprise storage. <clears throat> How many of you have had an argument with your storage folks? And I always pick on the storage folks directly because let's say you come into work and you see a whole bunch of alerts that say, I've got long IOs. You know, I, you've got IOs great, taking greater than 15 seconds. Your storage latency that you know, Century One or DPA or any of the great tools out there are reporting on and waking you up in the middle of the night on, and then you talk to your storage admin, and they go, no, everything's perfectly fine. Go away. <clears throat> and my, the thing that really drives me nuts is when they always say, your numbers are not accurate. <laughs> Don't you hate that? <clears throat> And literally, these numbers came from a, 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 a particular customer of ours. Their latency in guest was showing as high as half a second to disk. The storage admin, all flash array, arguably one of the better arrays out there, 0.8 millisecond reads and writes. They saw no problems. And what I can actually tell you is that there was a problem right here. And there was a problem right here. And there was a misassumption here. And at the end of the day, both numbers were completely accurate. The bottleneck was farther upstream than the enterprise storage. <clears throat> now, at the end of the day, storage latency, the time it takes for your system to get to disk and back, that is the best possible symptom that you've got that there is a problem. So take this slide, print it off, take it to your systems team. Because if you see elevated latency and they don't, it's not like there's just one little thing in between there. You've got the hypervisor engine itself. You've got storage controllers in guest. So you have the latency of the I.O. in guest. Warning threshold on here, 25 milliseconds for reads, 10 milliseconds for writes. And this is for a spindle or hybrid based array. If you're on all flash, I'd like to see no greater than about five to six milliseconds peak ever. That's not good. <clears throat> the virtual disk latency within the hypervisor can also be tracked. Work with your systems teams to get access to this. You don't need to be able to change anything, but you do need to be able to see read level stats. And I'm going to show you this. There's host kernel level IO pass through metrics that you can read. The warning threshold on there, if you see anything greater than roughly 100 microseconds, and at worst, definitely at least one millisecond, there's a problem. There's a big problem, because that means something in the hypervisor is choking, and it's stuck there. <coughs> on the storage array itself, you should, you really should, be able to measure the performance hit based on each one and on the disk pool that it's on. <clears throat> so a lot of different metrics in here, commands aborted per second, latency of the device driver on the array itself. Same thresholds above apply, 25 milliseconds for reads, 10 for writes for, for a spindle-based arrays, less than five to 10 for all flash. If you're seeing numbers a lot higher than this on the array itself, you have a problem. 
that array is, it's, it's, it just can't handle what you need it to do, and the performance there is holding your business back. Now, if you look at the queue devs, there are things that we can measure at the various layers. Now, some of these you've got access to, some you don't. There's an operating system disk queue. There's a virtual adapter queue depth that you, may, you might or might not be able to go to a tune in there. There's the virtual machine manager, there's a virtual SCSI adapter, there's a host storage stack, there's host drivers, depending on what hardware you're on. Then there's the fiber adapter, the HPA or the NIC, with per path queue depths and adapter queue depths. If you're running HPAs, there's fabric and switching speed, subnetting, zoning, link hops in there, or maybe even the switches that have their CPUs overwhelmed. Uh, so whatever monitoring they have there, get access to it. <clears throat> And then back at the storage itself, on the controller, storage processors, there's a long queue depth, the array service processor, CPU consumption, disk pool metrics, there's all kinds of stuff. So yeah, completely simple, right? They're right, you're wrong? No. Every single thing up here can be a bottleneck. And literally, if you have the monitoring coverage from the top to the bottom, all you gotta do is just go up the stack, go from the bottom, look at the metrics and go good, 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 bad. What's in between the two things? Why is that one bad and the next one below is good? You would be amazed at the amount of stuff that we find. We're talking $4 million infrastructures that a network admin had misconfigured a networking route. So to go from one physical machine to the next physical machine in the same rack, we're talking a two mile hop across a corporate campus. Scary, crazy stuff. You can't make this stuff up. It's amazing what we find. <clears throat> now. As part of this queuing, there are a handful of things that I'm going to share in here that are VMware specific or Hyper-V specific. Uh, how many of you are running the VMware platform? <clears throat> okay. How many of you are running the Hyper-V platform? Anybody with OpenStack or a Citrix Zen server, or Red Hat virtualization, or Oracle? Cool. All this stuff applies. The buzzwords may just be a little bit different for those hypervisors. <clears throat> so this one, on VMware specifically, there is an interesting phenomenon. So say this five times fast, disk.skednumrec outstanding. The acronym for it is DSNRO. What this really means is that there is a goofy default inside the VMware platform that thankfully Hyper-V doesn't do. If more than one virtual machine exists on the same physical machine, the queue depth goes from whatever is in the VM, so it just inherits it, it, tr it drops to 32. If you've built the VM correctly with multiple disk controllers, multiple drives, your in-guest queue could be as high as 1,000 or more, and then it drops to 32. You can actually see this very clearly. So visually, VMs, multiple disk adapters, the, the default one, 32. In VMware specifically, the pair virtual SCSI adapter default to 64. You can override it with a registry setting to 254. If more than one of these VMs disks are on the same data store, it drops to 32. It's not very fun. And I'm going to show you this. You can actually monitor the queue depths for bottlenecking. So check this out. Anybody here play with disk speed before? Awesome. If you haven't, okay, um, we got a couple extra minutes. Everybody in here, raise your right hand. Repeat after me. I promise that I will not take what I'm about to learn and run this in production <laughs> without prior authorization. Okay, you've been warned. <laughs> Disk speed, completely free. I think it's aka.ms slash disk SPD. Um, if you've heard of SQL I.O. before, disk speed is the replacement for SQL I.O. SQL I.O. now is now completely deprecated. You can't download it. Disk speed, command line utility, works great. I'll flat out tell you, this is not an accurate representation of a SQL Server workload. This is a good way to drive a type of SQL Server workload pattern to disk. You can use this to simulate different block sizes, uh, read or write, random or sequential, uh, change up the number of worker threads, change the intensity of each thread. <clears throat> and what you can do is now you can actually simulate a production workload. Now, keep in mind, all that stuff that I showed you before, it's going to flood it. So if there's bottlenecks in there and you run this even on a dev machine, 
with a sharing a storage device with production equipment, you may slow stuff down. So just keep in mind. <clears throat> so if you look, let's see if we can zoom in. Okay, disk spd.exe. This one we're going to do a 64K block size. I'm going to run this for 60 seconds. I'm going to turn off hardware uh, logging. I'm going to collect latency metrics. I'm going to do eight operations per thread, eight threads. I'm going to do a read workload on a 100 gig workload file. I'm going to store it into io.dat in that particular drive and folder. I'm going to use that little caret right there to pipe the output to a text file so I can read it. Now, I'm going to run those. And yeah, it's a batch file, not a PowerShell file. Sue me. <laughs> it works. It works just the same. <clears throat> OK, so that is running. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to log in to our test array. And thankfully enough, I've got a pretty decent test lab, so I can actually go see some of this stuff. <clears throat> and now you notice storage latency right there, 0.5 millisecond read. Q depth at the array, 44. And you can see it's pretty much a straight line. So roughly 0.5 millisecond reads. If I come over here, there is a counter inside VMware. If I go to virtual disk, average number of outstanding I.O. requests for read or write. What that translates to is the amount of I.O. stuck inside the hypervisor waiting to get out of the hypervisor to get to my network to get to the SAN. Check this out. Boink. That's the technical term, by the way. <laughs> that is a value inside the VMware platform that it has a maximum. 1,020 or th one, uh, 1,280 concurrent IOs pending inside the hypervisor. The second we get that many, it stops allowing more IO in. What does that just do? That slows my virtual machine I.O. down. Now, as soon as this thing finishes running, and it's done, <clears throat> so you saw on the array, 0.5 milliseconds for reads, correct? OK. So if I open up this test right here, <clears throat> the output of disk speed is actually really cool. And I'll zoom in here so you can see it. So it takes the command line parameters that you put in here, and then it translates it to English. <clears throat> so Duration, 60 seconds. We're measuring latency, no randomization at this point. Path, think time, burst time, software and hardware cache is disabled. 64K block size, random IO alignment, eight operations per thread, eight threads per file, blah, 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 blah. Hey, check this out. That is CPU consumption on that machine by process time, by kernel time, which is the second column, and then the user time. So you can see 1.4% of the CPU consumed on that CPU right there was related to I.O. activity. <clears throat> total I.O. Bytes read, I.O.s total, megabytes per second, I.O.s per second, average latency, standard deviation. So right there, that is 1,458 average megabytes per second read. This is an all flash array. That's pretty darn good. IOPS, now 64K IOPS, that's 23,000 64K IOPS. So if you look at the numbers that are given to you by normal storage vendors, they always do either five or 512 byte tests, which is lying to you, or a 4K test. So 44328 times uh, 16. So that's roughly a third of a million IOPS with one test. That's cool. <clears throat> But that number right here, I'm going to zoom in and zoom out. Average latency, as seen in GAST, 2.7 milliseconds. The array showed 0.5 milliseconds. Now, this is an extreme example. But honestly, because the array is good <clears throat> and the host had enough power behind it, that's not a massive difference when you look at just 2.7 milliseconds for that kind of activity. But when you think about the fact that that is over a five times performance hit, that's significant. Don't ever let your storage admin tell you that your numbers are incorrect. They are correct from its point of view. 
You can take this test. You can go run this. If they give you access or they get you, at, you know, metrics off the storage array, you can put them side by side. Just keep in mind, a lot of these arrays are shared by a whole lot of different servers. So if you're running a test, you might still have background stuff in there. Cool. Pretty neat, huh? Yeah. How many of you are going to use this carefully and not trash production? OK, the rest of you weren't listening there. <laughs> OK. So again, disk speed, completely free, works great. I love that tool. Just remember, it's not a SQL Server specific workload. It is a SQL Server like workload, depending on the parameters you put into it. Great question. The question is, for SQL Server, would you use 8K? <clears throat> Honestly, I'd use a bunch. I'd use an 8K read. <clears throat> I'd use a 64K read. I'd use a 64K write, an 8K write. Logs are in a 60K write. If you're looking at read, or read ahead, then 64K, 256K. For different analytics workloads, could be 256, could be 1 meg. Backups could be 1 meg, 2 meg. Test all kinds of different patterns in there. See how your array performs. You'd be surprised. Some of these arrays, the bigger the block size or the harder you push it, the worse they perform. So just get a good baseline. See what it does. Rerun it in a couple months. See if the array performance has degraded. If that's the case, go back to your storage team. See what they can do. Good question. <clears throat> Sector size? We'll grab that one afterwards. <laughs> uh, for, uh, so formatting the disks depends on the kind of storage that you're on. Uh, 4K is a standard block size. I usually do 64K. If you're on hyper-converged, I would question that and revisit 4 or 8K. It's kind of interesting. It is recommended to use 64K. If you do a whole bunch of different tests, you'll find that on some hyper-converged, uh, 64K is not as optimal as they would want you to believe. OK. Now let's hit networking. <clears throat> How many of you does your server room look like this? <laughs> I'm so sorry, sir. <laughs> I really, really hope it doesn't work like this. This particular environment, guess what the problem was? We had a failover cluster that was failing over randomly because the heartbeat cable was somewhere in this mess, held in by gravity because the clip was broken. And when somebody was in there messing around with cables, it would jiggle it and cause a break in the heartbeat stream. I wanted to walk in here with a pair of hedge clippers, tell them to start over, but that doesn't really go over too well. <clears throat> okay. Things that you can do in Guest. By default, window, the Windows operating system will actually only use one CPU core for network traffic. Now, that doesn't sound that bad, but when you look at really, really pushing a 10 gig network adapter, you might find that the CPU consumption of that particular CPU is actually close to 100%. Yeah. <clears throat> what this command right here does, hang on. <clears throat> it allows you to use Windows receive side scaling to take the CPU consumption for that network adapter and just spread it out. And in that case, if you're looking at 10 gig throughput or greater than 10 gig throughput, that really helps you scale. Otherwise, I'm not exaggerating. If you use some of the network t uh, testing tools, you might actually find that you're CPU bound and not networking bound. Now, I'll tell you, it is honestly fairly rare to see a SQL Server workload push a full 10 gig adapter throughput consistently. Your mileage may vary, but this is something, this one setting right here is something that I do to pretty much every VM out there. It's one of those, if you build for the worst case scenario, which is crazy consumption, and you don't need it, the worst thing that happens is it's more efficient you know, today. <clears throat> so you can run that command right there in a PowerShell prompt, or go into the adapter, go to the advanced driver uh, configuration settings, receive side scaling, set it to enabled. <clears throat> now, at the end of the day, how, uh, can you repeat that? Uh, question is, do you have to do that in the registry as well as the card? Uh, most of the time, yeah. <clears throat> um, so how many of you blame your networking team for everything? Because, <laughs> I mean, DBA is, uh, really stands for default blame acceptor, right? <clears throat> so when there's a performance problem, they come to you, they say it's slow, you blame the network team to get that off your back while you go in and look to see if it's really your fault. 
That's just how it works. <clears throat> then the networking team blames storage, storage team blames security. I mean, it's just a fun circle of life right there. <clears throat> but at the, uh, can you repeat that? Oh well, yeah, uh, his comment was the application team blames them first, and yeah, it's just the way it goes. But my biggest thing here through the entire presentation is be completely objective. Throw emotion out of this. So with your network, what else can we do? We're gonna validate how much throughput we can get. There is a free utility called iPerf. Now I know I've showed this here before, completely free. I use this at least once a week for different customers, sometimes more. It's available for compiled for Windows at iperf.fr. <clears throat> we have a free how-to guide, free PDF, no contact info required, out at hfxte.ch slash iperf. It looks like this. You run iperf minus s as the receiver, <clears throat> iperf minus c, and then some machine name or an IP, minus t10 for 10 seconds, minus capital P10 for 10 worker threads. At the end of that test, you end up with something that looks like this. And that little bit down at the bottom right there, 8.86 gigabit per second on a 10 gig NIC, uh, that actually works pretty well. So let me show you how to go run this. <clears throat> so on this particular machine, exact same thing. Iperf, my, Iperf 3 space minus S, right there. And yes, that is in PowerShell. <laughs> <clears throat> so we're letting that run. On this other machine, come over here, same kind of thing. iperf3 minus c destination machine minus t10 minus p 10 worker threads. <clears throat> so you can see 10 gigabit, what? 15 gigabit. How is that possible? Anybody want to guess what's going on? Can you repeat that? Network teaming. <clears throat> now in this case, I'm being sneaky. What's the fastest way to send a whole boatload of data over the network? Yep, the answer is don't send it over the network. <clears throat> These two VMs are on the exact same physical machine. At the end of the day, if you have the hypervisor set up right, and your systems teams can do this, that network traffic never even makes it to the physical network adapter. It stays in the back plane of the hypervisor, and the throughput is much higher there. <clears throat> now, it sounds like a cheat, but there's actually a real practical application for this. How many of you move really, really big amounts of data every single night with ETL, or backups, or moving stuff around? Your VM admins could put a rule that says the machine you're getting this data from and your SQL server can and should live on the same physical machine. Boop. You just hacked the network. And you may end up with a pretty darn good performance boost. Because right now, if the network is what's holding you back on those file transfers, this can actually help you. Now, a lot of times the network doesn't hold us back. So, Test it, validate it. If that works, what they could do is actually set up a rule to start right at the time that you're actually set to copy all your stuff. Turn that on. The VMs will migrate to the same physical machine together. Let this run, and then when it's done, they can issue a command to turn that back off. So if things need to better load balance, it's free to do so. Pretty cool, huh? The question is, what if it's a round trip problem and not a throughput problem? Well, at least with iperf, you have a throughput test. Use ping, use any sort of other mechanism you've got to, to trace how long it takes to get there and back, and then take that information on to your systems team. The question is, can iperf do that? Not that I'm aware of. It's more of a throughput test rather than a latency test. If somebody does have a good tool to actually go test this other than ping, let me know. <clears throat> okay. Yep. Yes, sir. So the question is, if the VMs are on the same SAN as a storage, uh, can this circumvent the network? Well, the VMs have to be set up right with the same virtual network. 
So the sand is pretty kind of off to the side. Yeah, come on up here afterwards. We'll, we'll talk through it, yeah. <clears throat> okay, physical compute. This is really where the core of the work is actually done. So you've got a couple of server types here. You've got rack mount servers. So in this chassis contains everything you need. So CPU, memory, network, maybe storage, maybe not. <clears throat> you've got blade servers. Ha, try not to cough on everybody here. <clears throat> you've got blade servers that have CPU, memory, and potentially network, maybe storage, on the same blade server, but they do this so that you can get greater density in there and maybe have some sort of centralized management in here. Now, there is a third type. There are servers that are powered by smoke. <clears throat> <laughs> now, there's a theory in electrical engineering that all electronics globally are powered by smoke because when you let the smoke out, they don't work anymore. <clears throat> yeah, this one was funny. <laughs> Um, the is a brand new equip, piece of equipment. This blade had three terabytes of RAM on it. When they installed it, prior to them even paying for it, the uh, installer said, oh, you got a hardware fault on here. Pull it out, put it back in. As soon as it reconnected, all we heard was Psh! and smoke just started pouring out of the back of the thing. So um, yeah, these things aren't perfect. <laughs> By the way, that was $350,000. <clears> yeah, now it's a paperweight but it's a really good conversation piece. <laughs> okay, compute resource selection. Your CPUs are completely critical. They're absolutely vital to get them right for your particular workload. Memory speed is definitely in there because honestly, SQL Server does everything out of RAM. So the fastest possible RAM that we can get matters. Memory density is also important. If you buy chips that, uh, or if you buy you know, machines that only let you go up to let's say 384 gigs of RAM, you put your workloads on there, and you find that you are out of memory well before you run out of CPU, well, you are wasting SQL Server licensing. That's not good. So if you add more memory, as long as you contain and control the CPU scheduling overhead, we'll talk about that in a little bit, then you're okay. VM density is big, maximize your licenses. Now, on the thing that everything connects to in there, it's called a main board. On the main board, we have sockets. There's four CPU sockets on this particular example. Most of you probably have two sockets. There are four. Uh, occasionally, you'll find eight, and there are logical architectures that can go up to a 32-socket machine. It's insane what they can do. Now, why do we have the sockets? <clears throat> By the way, this is important. <laughs> uh, for NUMA, now, this is called non-uniform memory access. <clears throat> this is called a NUMA node. What this really means is that we have a socket on the main board and memory right next to it. The proximity there is really, really tight. And that way, because of physics, we actually have these things as close as humanly possible. Because even though we're talking nanosecond access time, that's still time. <clears throat> Locality matters. So if, with, if, with, if we were to just take this and install Windows on here, that NUMA alignment is actually important. It's extended through the host configuration, through the BIOS, and you can actually see this in guests. So me as a programmer, if I can program my program to stay inside one NUMA node, my memory lookups are quicker, and therefore I make my app quicker. Now that CPU can still access the memory locally. It can still access RAM on another NUMA node. Not that big of a deal, but on average, looking at a, about a, a but a 2.2, 2.3 times performance penalty, sometimes greater. That hurts, especially considering you may have you know, a couple hundred gigs of memory in your SQL servers, and if it's not lined up right, it may be somewhere else. So you're looking at a two, two and a half times performance penalty to do everything that you're trying to do. It's not cool. Now, that stuff matters. We're gonna go back to that when we talk to vCPU architecture. But in terms of the CPUs that you have today, historically, the Intel Xeon is pretty much the choice that we've been dealing with for a while. <clears throat> uh, AMD has recently come out with some good chips. The benchmarks are still, still coming out. You know, I'm, I'm cautious, uh, cautiously optimistic that these are actually going to be you know, good enough for our SQL Server workloads. But let them come out. Let's, I want some competition in there, because quite frankly, the CPU vulnerabilities lately have been really annoying. <laughs> 
Okay, for those of you with a one or two socket CPU configuration, the nomenclature for these chips, we're just gonna talk Intel Xeon. They used to start with E5, today they start with six, and they're four digit numbers, so six something, something, something. In a four or eight socket configuration, they used to start with E7, now it's eight something, something, something. <clears throat> The generations, if you look way back in the day, you know, it was either E5 or E7, about five years later, it's the E5, E7, V2s, and then V3, and then V4, and because marketing, they're not V5s, these are Xeon scalable series, these are six, something, 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 or eight. You can tell it's the first generation scalable CPU because of the second number up there, it's a one. So 6144, 6156, things like that. And just recently, the second gen scalable series came out, and it has a two for the second digit. Now, these are, these are very rare. They're just now shipping. Uh, most of you are probably dealing with either the E5 V4s or the scalable gen ones. And they're all great chips. They really are. They're super fast. <clears throat> and then just to make things more confusing, Intel decided to start calling them bronze series, or gold series, or silver, or platinum, because, well, that makes complete sense, instead of just having an iteration and a number, right? <clears throat> if you see one with an M after the end, then essentially Intel has decided to flip a bit inside their architecture and charge you a lot more because they can uh, give you more memory density. You know, it works. You can get some of these chips that can do a lot of RAM. Now, the bottom line that I wanna stress here with CPUs, gigahertz does not guarantee performance. I'll repeat that. Gigahertz does not mean fast or slow, not directly. You have to worry about core count. You have to worry about compute performance, the raw overall performance of what this chip can actually do. <clears throat> then you have to figure out what does your workload actually do? Is it a normal OLTP machine where it's very single threaded? Or is it more like a reporting workload, or an OL, you know, OLTP or OLAP workload, something that is very parallelizable? And in those scenarios, sometimes faster cores with a lower core count matter more than a whole boatload of cores where each core itself might be a lot slower. Now, this is completely avoiding the SQL Server licensing discussion. I'll let you take that up with Microsoft out there. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, you see different benchmarks, you know, pass marks, back in, things like that. These are one type of mathematical operation numbers, and they don't necessarily represent all the things that a SQL Server can do. Now, there's no perfect benchmark out there, but at the end of the day, I find that I like Geekbench better. Now, I'll talk about that here in a second, but we've got to figure out that core count thing first. How many of you played with hyperthreading? Cool. For those of you that didn't raise your hand, chances are you have, you just didn't know it. Essentially, in essence, what Intel has done is they basically say, hey, for, all, for everything that you're doing, on that clock cycle, whatever available processing power is there, we're going to present it as a second logical core. So let's say on this laptop, it's a four physical core laptop, hyperthreading is turned on, therefore I get eight logical cores. Now, if, if all of my workloads on here were using 50% or less of that physical core, well, now I've got eight cores, things can time slice, and you know, we'll get a performance boost out of it. But what if my CPUs are at, say, 70 or 80 or 90% busy? Well, that remainder that is presented as a second logical core, that might be squeezing things. <clears throat> If the workload is trying to balance itself across two logical cores, and one of them doesn't have much left on it, and the other one has a lot, things can get imbalanced, it can slow the whole thing down. I'm not telling you to disable hyperthreading, not unless you want to completely mitigate a lot of these CPU vulnerabilities. But leave it enabled, do not factor this in with your CPU core assignments or a lot of your projections on how to actually go scale your environment. They're there to help you, don't think of them as actual cores, and then you'll be in a much better spot. <clears throat> now, I mentioned it before, Geekbench. Super cool program. Uh, it's free as long as you don't mind them sending the results back to their database. Now, it sounds like a bad thing. I'm actually okay with that, because now I can go search their database, which is publicly accessible, and get information on CPUs that I don't own or something that I'm thinking about buying, and that's cool. 
Now that's on the free version that where they send it back. The paid version, it's 25 bucks, it's 100 bucks for the pro version. It's worth every penny if you do a lot of this stuff. It's really cool. <clears throat> so browser.primatelabs.com is where you can actually go search for a lot of these things. It's pretty handy. Please review the per core scores. What this test is, it's actually a bunch of different benchmarking tests and mathematical operations, things like that, and they put it together to form one number. The number is relative to some CPU make and model for that version of the program. And essentially, if you look at two different CPUs and your per core number is higher for one, well, the overall performance of that is higher, and that's a good thing. It looks kind of like this. <clears throat> now, this is uh, one of the machines in my lab. Uh, E7-4870 at 2.4 gigahertz, it's an old machine. Still works just fine. So it's honestly a 40 physical core machine. You can see right here, 20 processors, 20 cores. That's because I ran this in a 20 core virtual machine. Works really well. All you gotta do is click CPU benchmark down here and you run. Now ignore the multi-core numbers because I could run this on a 40 core machine or a 20 core machine in a VM. The CPUs are the same. I look at the multi-core and extrapolate that way. This is really the best thing that I found that gets me the closest to the actual performance differences that you will see in SQL Server based on the CPUs that you're looking at. <clears throat> Relative performance. Now, Geekbench version 5 just came out. The benchmarking database out there is not yet populated by a ton of different chips. So for the most part, I still look at version 4, even though I'll run version 5. Uh, you can find pretty much anything out there. And you can see, let's say, this big monster chip here from a couple generations ago, the E58890V4. That's a 24 physical core machine at 2.2 gigahertz, 3.4 gigahertz uh, turbo boost. The per core Geekbench, 3042. <clears throat> That's pretty good. If you take a look at about the fastest thing that you can buy, Platinum 8256, four core chip, 3.8 gigahertz base, 3.9 gig turbo boost, Geekbench score about 4,700. Gold, 6244, 6246, 6254, 812, 18 core chips respectively, 5,000, 4,800, 4,600. So let's say you are upgrading from this to that. That's a 50 something percent performance gain. That's cool. Because guess what? If your SQL Server licensing footprint stays the same and you just got a 50% CPU boost, life is good. Now keep in mind, your exhibited performance might not be a 50% improvement. What if, you're, what if you're memory bound or what if you're storage bound and not CPU bound? Well, your mileage may vary there. But if everything that you're doing is waiting on CPU and nothing else, which is rare, uh, you're going to see a pretty big performance gain. Now, Platinum numbers, I mean, they have a 56 core chip out now. I don't even want to know what that's going to do to SQL Server licensing. <laughs> now, from a workstation perspective, Core i9-9900K, I have one of these. I absolutely love it. The per core Geekbench score, 6800. It's quick. It's really, really quick. <clears throat> now, again, completely free. Yes, sir. Yeah, question is, if you run this yourselves and you find your numbers are far below what the public database shows, does that mean you've got some other problems going on? And most likely, yeah. Uh, you know, it's worth looking into. I don't want to say definitively, but it's definitely worth looking into. And that's why I love this publicly accessible database, because you can see what others have done. Just, you know, keep in mind, they may have broken equipment too, so, so their numbers may be way off. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, great question. Give me about 20 minutes and I'll answer that for you. Cool. Now, if you're looking at the cloud, and I'll flat out tell you that cloud is a great use case for a whole lot of problems. It is not the use case for every problem. <laughs> 
On-prem is still great. Microsoft confirmed this. They just released Microsoft Arc. It includes on-prem platform management with a ton of automation. It's cool stuff. If you're looking at the cloud, you can do this. Check it out. Microsoft is cool enough to actually tell you the CPU type of the different, uh, the different services out there. So if you're looking at a performance difference, you can actually take where you're at right now, you can go take where they're giving you out there, run the numbers side by side. You'd be amazed at what you can actually find. And who knows? Maybe you've got pretty good equipment on-prem, and you're looking at a general purpose machine out there where the raw CPU performance is a lot slower. Well, is it worth you maybe paying 10% more to get a 25% performance gain just from you know, CPU change? It might actually be worth it. So keep that in mind. Now, there's a lot of monitoring things in here. There's a lot of interesting challenges. Let's skip through that one real quick. Okay. Now, to, to further address your question over there, the VM admin perspective on this is quite interesting. <clears throat> if you go and look at what a VM admin normally goes and sees when they build a VM for you, they're just going, yeah, you need eight cores, check the box, hit OK. Because essentially, they're just looking at this top line right here. You understand NUMA. You know CPU affinity, things like that inside SQL Server. They have the ability to say cores per socket. Most of the time, the hypervisors will ignore you. It goes and automatically assigns this. Not a lot of fun. <clears throat> so Hyper-V right here, VMware up at the top left. They have the ability to go tune this stuff if you need to, which may not be always the case. Now, bottom line, how do we need to align this stuff? Well, first of all, if you walk on a Monday morning and see this, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you've got challenges there. <laughs> Bottom line, we got to align this stuff with the physical machine. You have the ability to go set cores and cores per socket for your virtual machines. You know the physical machine topology. You can do this. First of all, before we decide alignment, we have to figure out how many we actually need. First of all, ignore the vendor requirement completely. The vendors always get it wrong. They say you need 32 cores when you need a phone to run it on, you know, things like that. You don't need that much, usually. But how much do you actually need? You have to have knowledge of that individual workload. And I know I harp on this a lot, but it's being objective. How much do you actually need at peak consumption during a business window that matters to the business? Identify those time frames. I mean, if an uh, index maintenance operation takes an hour and a half in the middle of the night and the CPU spike way up, does your business actually feel a hit, a problem with that thing actually runs? If nobody's working, nothing's accessing a website, no backups are running, does it matter? Not really. But if you're a 24-7 e-commerce operation or financial or healthcare, things like that, that time window might really matter to you. So you have to identify that. If you're a Monday to Friday, 9 to 5 shop, nobody does anything outside of that, well, ignore those pieces of time and just focus on what matters. As a VM, we need to size the number of CPUs to what we actually need now with a little bit of headroom in there, but we don't have to go crazy with it. You can always resize this stuff later. It's literally shut the VM down, add, turn on, you're done. No problem. I want to say target the 40 to 60% utilization during that critical window that matters to you. It might be a little lower. If you get a little bit higher than that, you might start seeing some CPU pressure, and then you, know, you might be a little tight in there. Monitoring this stuff is absolutely critical. Now, how many of you have a running baseline of resource consumption in your environment? So it's about a quarter of the folks in here. For those of you that do, um, bless you, <laughs> thank you. For those of you that don't, you're now guilty until proven innocent. When somebody comes to you and says it's running slow, because if they say it's running slow, how can you show them how it's running compared to when it's running well? You can't, and that gets tough. So what we need to do is we need to figure out how much we actually need. We actually call it right sizing. So in this particular environment right here, this was captured with just Windows Perfmon, nothing fancy at all in there. You can see CPU consumption by core. It's a five-minute median across an entire business day. So you can see something runs at about 5 o'clock in the morning. Most people at the shop got in a little bit earlier. There's a batch that got in about 7, 7.15. Everybody slacked off. A bunch of other people got in at 8. 
You can see right about here, a bunch of people went to lunch and then nobody really did a lot of work and everybody left by about five o'clock. And then some reports ran at about six, seven. Index maintenance on one core ran at about uh, eight at night. A bunch of stuff ran at nine, 10, 11, and then all was quiet. That's a fingerprint for what this machine is actually using. <clears throat> That's an eight core machine. Do you need all eight cores? What if you're a small shop and every penny matters? If the vendor says you need eight and you look at this, I'm going through an upgrade, I'm about to buy some more licensing. Why should you spend thousands of dollars more on licensing that is just going to be sitting there doing absolutely nothing? So what I would say is if you're conservative and you want plenty of headroom in there, the only spike that we've got on here is literally right here, and that's on one core. That's not on all cores. So be conservative. Eyeball this stuff. Knock this thing down to six. If you want to run it a little bit tighter and then monitor it a little bit closer, go to four. Test it. You can actually turn off some of the CPUs in SQL Server before you make a single infrastructure change. See how the thing runs. Turn it back on if needed. Yes, sir? Uh, Hyper-threading uh, Good question. Does hyper-threading affect licensing? And thankfully, no. Um, it's in all of the, uh, the licensing guides, and they're pretty clear about it, which is great. <laughs> Cool. So now, how do we get this? That's the scary part. How can we figure out that configuration? If you've got that number, and again, Perfmon can do it, Century One, DPA, Redgate, SQL Monitor, I mean, any of the really good tools out there will give you a lot of this info, and then you just look at what matters the most. Now, if you've got that count, how do we get the configuration? <clears throat> so if you're building a VM and you need 10 cores, if your physical machine, in this case, let's say two by 14 core physical chips, 128 gigs of RAM per socket, so 28 core physical machine with 256 gigs of RAM. If the VM needs 10 cores and 64 gigs of RAM, that fits very carefully, you know, comfortably, inside of one socket. So build the VM for one CPU socket, 10 cores, and the hypervisor will listen, and it'll do everything it can to pin it, essentially place it on one NUMA node, and it'll stay there. Your memory lookups are quicker, and life is good. Let's say I need 16 cores, though. 16 is greater than 14. Don't assume the hypervisor is that efficient at allowing more than the amount of cores present in one physical core to be presented in guest. So the hypervisor is going to split it. You're going to end up with a two virtual socket by eight core virtual machine. Keep in mind here, if the memory footprint is bigger than one NUMA node, but the core count is smaller, the hypervisor will still place it on one NUMA node, and you will have a memory imbalance at the hypervisor layer. That's not good. That is a performance penalty, and that's really hard to spot in guest. Hyperthreading, same kind of thing. Right there. If you build a VM, let's say 18 physical cores per socket, so 36 logical cores. <clears throat> if I build a VM, let's say with 48 virtual CPUs, so technically, if you're looking at a one-to-one -one map on there, that would actually fit. Realistically, if you over-allocate like that, you have a whole lot of context switching under the hood, and you end up slowing things down, potentially. That VM is really a lot bigger than you want. You can verify a lot of this stuff to see what that cross lookup actually does. CPU core info, it's right out there. It's part of the Microsoft Sys internal suite. It's pretty neat. It gives you a logical to physical core map as part of a CPU output. It actually gives you the socket map on there and the NUMA nodes that you actually see. And then my favorite, because, well, I'm a geek, <clears throat> cross NUMA node access cost, meaning the amount of overhead to access a remote NUMA node. In this case, 1.2 times, 1.4 times. That's pretty high. So now, if we build the VM and things are doing cross NUMA lookups, that's that kind of a performance penalty you can expect on memory lookups. It's pretty interesting. You can spot check this inside SQL Server yourself. Find the CPUs. Uh, so right click on the instance, hit properties, go to processor. You'll see under processor, there's all. Expand out NUMA nodes. And if you have multiple NUMA nodes presented to the VM, you'll see it clear as day in there. NUMA node one, two, zero, whatever. And then under there, X amount of CPUs. Pretty handy. 
helps you go balance this. It also helps because if you've got cost threshold for parallelism, max degree of parallelism, we'll talk about that in a little bit, you can start to line that up with what the VM is seeing. If the VM is lined up with what the physical machine does, you get a performance improvement. It's pretty handy. Yes, sir. So great questions. So it's good questions and great questions. Good questions are the ones that I have an answer for. Great questions are the ones that I have a slide for coming up. <laughs> so give me just a couple minutes and I'll answer that one for you. <laughs> cool. Now, the imbalance here is absolutely fascinating. This particular example, there was a physical machine, a little bit older, had six cores per socket, physical cores. The VM was built for eight. So it was given a two socket, or excuse me, a one socket, eight core VM. It was kind of floating between the physical environments. It's not good. So what we've got here is a CPU baseline. Average consumption is highlighted in red across a given day in a 15 minute time slice. We found a NUMA imbalance, went in and fixed it by just forcing the VM to be a two by three instead of a one by eight, or a one by six. Look what that thing did. If you see the difference on that, that's pretty substantial. That was about five clicks to go fix that. The CPU consumption on the SQL Server went down by a full third. Do that across the board in your environment. You might actually get a pretty substantial performance improvement while reducing CPU consumption because you're not having to deal with context switching at a bunch of different layers in there. It's pretty interesting. Now, so here's the slide for you. Uh, SQL Server 2016 and above have enabled something called soft NUMA. Essentially, if you see this in your SQL Server error log, what you're going to find is that we've got the ability for the SQL Server layer to, through software, subdivide a physical NUMA node and make it split into multiple virtual NUMA nodes. They do this to try to make CPU scheduling better. Now, I call this five layers of NUMA hell, <laughs> uh, because at the end of the day, if things are not aligned properly through all of these, you can have a performance penalty. And a lot of times, it might actually catch you off guard. For example, if I take a SQL server on a 2 by 12 physical machine, I've got eight cores on it. If I go from eight to 10 cores, logical, right? You cross that eight threshold, and you might end up with soft NUMA in SQL server giving you a 2 by 5. Well, that might just mess up maxed up could be really, really interesting in here. Performance penalty. Now, CPU scheduling is arguably one of the biggest things that we've got. Like I said, every single thing flows through the hypervisor resource queue. We want to minimize this. Reduce that time, speed stuff up. You can speed things up. You just got to be careful with this. Now, if you think about it, at the end of the day, you think that when you hit go on that query, stuff's actually getting executed properly. It's not entirely that easy. When you hit go, it takes a little tiny bit of time to get that thing actually onto the CPU scheduling queue itself. And then it sits there and waits for its time slice. It's called ready time. <clears throat> While it starts running, it can be paused. It can be dealt with SMP scheduling in there. Uh, it may have to stop, then it goes again, then it stops, and then it goes again. It's not very fun. And during that entire time, we might have context switching from hyperthreading slowing us down. We might have power savings per core that slow us down. It's not fun. Now, this looks really severe. Realistically, if this is done right, you're still looking at less than 1% performance overhead. But this is how the hypervisor actually does it. Now, for those of you on Hyper-V, you can measure this. It's kind of fun. The amount of time spent in these queues per virtual CPU is measured in nanoseconds with a counter called CPU wait time per dispatch. It's really, really cool. You can take the aggregate across all cores and then average them out, or you can look at the individual core values. The default sample interval is one second. You take the average over the collection interval, which is X number of seconds with Windows Perfmon. <clears throat> you take that, divide it by the number of nanoseconds in that collection interval, multiply 100 by 100%, by and you end up with a column that looks like this. You convert it to that percentage, and that is your performance penalty in terms of percent for that machine at that point in time. To translate all that, this is a measurement of how much your VM has slowed down because of everything going on in the physical machine 
and or the CPU malalign or misalignment with the physical machine boundaries. Pretty interesting. Now, if you're on VMware, same type of counter, slightly different layer or way to look at it. <clears throat> it's measured in milliseconds. Same exact thing. Some value across all the machines or use the individual core values. Instead of this, the, the kind of arbitrary numbers that Hyper-V Perfmon gives you, it's now a 20-second polling interval. So you take the sum and the number, or divided by the number of cores, divided by 20,000 milliseconds, multiply it by 100%, you end up with that same percentage. That's for the real-time view. Or if you're looking per core, take the worst one you've got, divide it by 20,000, multiply it by 100. There's your percentage you're going to find that the hypervisor is a lot more efficient than you think. Most of the time, I see 0.5%. No big deal, no problem. But if you start to see things at about 2.5% and they're sustained like that, that's kind of my yellow line. If you look at about 3.5%, that's pretty much where I draw the line and say, this is too hot, we can't do this, it's slowing down, you tend to start to feel that performance penalty. Now, there's an additional challenge with this. The more CPUs you have on the VM, the harder it is for everything to get aligned properly. So one vCPU might actually get through the scheduling queue a little bit quicker. If it goes too far out of balance, things might get unstable inside the operating system. So one jumps ahead, a hypervisor is going to detect this, and it'll actually pause it to let the rest catch up and then move forward. And by the way, Animations and PowerPoint are a pain. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, what's going to happen here if you're dedicating one physical thing to one vector? Great question. Great question. And the question is, what's going to happen here if you dedicate one physical machine to one VM? This can still happen. However, the amount of time spent in the queue and this SMP scheduling is going to be as low as humanly possible. You might be looking at you know, 2 to 10 milliseconds over a 20-second polling interval. So it's, not, it's barely even measurable, let alone noticeable. So in that case, there's no time spent in the queues. Life is good. Now, this particular act right here happens on all hypervisors. Unfortunately, VMware is the only one that will actually expose these counters to where you can sample it. It's called CPU co-stop, measured in milliseconds. Same kind of thing, just don't make it a percentage. By the way, if you see a lot of this stuff, that's a mega performance penalty. Run, don't walk through system administrators. Look for sustained stretches of time where you see this or sharp spikes in the numbers. Uh, CoStop is amplified with storage I.O. Uh, whenever you have a snapshot on there, there's a VMware KB article on there in case you're interested. Okay, virtual disks, we're gonna skip ahead because we're a little tight on time. Bottom line, when a storage administrator tells you to uh, go in and not worry about a data disk and a log disk and a tempdb disk, nothing can be further from the truth. From their perspective, it probably doesn't matter. From yours, it definitely does. Windows does IO queuing by disk and by disk controller. So does the hypervisor. So what I always say, leverage all the available disk controllers that you have on the virtual machine and build out the virtual machine disks specifically for log, tempdb data, system, you know, stuff like that. Attach them using Perfmon to go validate your different load parameters. Say, you know, disk controller one, you get data. Disk controller two, you get logs. Disk controller three, you get, you know, the operating system in tempdb because the OS doesn't get touched much. You know, balance them out accordingly like that. Same thing with your database files. If you see a hotspot on disk, use more file groups, use more data files. Don't go berserk with it, but be careful with this. You can actually go and spread this workload out and make things better, quite honestly. Be careful, use Perfmon, look at the workload consumption across the different drives. Make sure things aren't competing at the exact same point in time. There is a counter in there, disk queue length, inside the physical disk or logical disk counter in Perfmon. You can actually measure the queues associated with this stuff. It's pretty handy. Okay, my starting point, not where I end. C drive for the OS, D drive for the SQL Server instance home, E drive system databases, F drive, one or more drives for user database data, one or more for user database logs, one or more for tempdb, depending on how aggressive your tempdb consumption is. If you are doing SAN to SAN LUN replication, 
you might want to put the page file in a different one, and depending on how you're doing the replication, mark it as a swap drive, don't replicate the contents. If you're doing local backups, different drive for those. This is a starting point, but it just shows logical segmentation of duties in there. Split these things out, open the paths up, because the more you can parallelize this workload, the better things get. Now, VMware specific, you can override the queue depth in guest. So yeah, registry setting up here that tells you how to do it. Do not blindly apply this. Do not just go do this and forget about it. Because if you haven't fixed the stuff underneath, you basically just said this thing can push harder when there's a bottleneck underneath, and you actually make it worse. Now, uh, see, I, gentleman by the name of Glenn Berry has a really good set of diagnostic scripts. You can turn around and collect disk stall. We have a variant of that out on our website, completely free. You can actually sample disk stall over and over and over again and actually analyze it to figure out if SQL Server has a hotspot on disk that Perfmon doesn't see. If you see disk latency, they call it disk stall. In SQL Server, by database data or log file, and you don't see it on Perfmon, you have an I.O. contention problem getting to an individual file. Compare that to the OS, compare that to the VM layer, and life is good. Now, with parallelism on the SQL Server side, go look at cost threshold of parallelism, max degree of parallelism. Use a non-standard cost threshold for parallelism. There's tons of people here that can give you their opinion on this. There is no right answer. Be scientific about it, you can go measure this. Max degree of parallelism for me is a number of cores that an individual query will try to use if it goes parallel. Now my starting point on here is the number of CPUs in one NUMA node. If you only have one NUMA node, take a look at your workload. Maybe you would want it to use all the available cores. Maybe you would want it to use half the cores or a quarter of the cores. It's up to you. But just align this with that physical NUMA topology and the virtual NUMA topology. Line up your workload better, you end up with an overall performance gain across the entire thing. VM memory, yeah. You should never, ever, ever overcommit RAM in a VM, period. Check the box right here. Hyper-V's got the equivalent, reserve all guest memory. It says the hypervisor can steal memory from, this, from other VMs, but not this one. If you do that, now you're safe to run things like lock pages in memory. Large memory pages, things like that. Large memory pages are highly recommended. They are a big boost to performance, especially in a VM, just not when you're using column store. Now, at the end of the day, put it all together. Virtualization really is the assumption for platforms today, either in the cloud, on-prem. By the way, all this stuff directly applies out in the cloud, too. You just may not have access to it. Determine the core count that you need not necessarily what the vendor tells you. Align the virtual CPUs with the physical CPU boundary. You will get a performance gain. You saw it clear as day with the benchmark at the beginning of the show. Optimize the storage for high concurrent workload performance. You do this right, you really will get bare metal performance. And at the end of the day, there's nobody from Microsoft in here, is there? You can maximize your licensing, maybe save some money. Cool, any questions? Yes, sir. Cool. Actually, we're, we're out of time. If you have questions, come on up. And if we get kicked out of the room, we'll go out into the hallway. <laughs>